So well, thanks, Adam. and thanks everybody for coming. I um, just want to echo that again. Um, if I sound a little bit too confident, it's because we just listened to I Am A God. So you know, I still got those vibes going right now. Um, this conversation is really interesting to me, um, you know, because like, like Doc said, you know, I think this music is so powerful in terms of a pedagogical stance that we can, we can use this lens in a classroom to inform a bigger conversation of subjectivity, and that's what I'm, I'm hoping to do today. Um, first, I think that we need to start at, you know, what does it mean to actually have access? This conference is about transforming that access, but without beginning a conversation of what access actually means in, in America today, I think that it's, it's void. Um, and I think that the way that I'm going to define access is, is some sort of an invisible type of privilege. Um, I think that comes from a, a critical race theory standpoint, that you know, whiteness sort of constructs um, the nature of this tamed beast that we, we can't really see um, if we're not looking, um, if we're not trained to look. It's certainly there right in front of us, but whiteness is constructed in a way that doesn't allow those that are taking part in the privilege to actually see the privilege, um, which is obviously problematic. But whiteness, um, you know, renders this this privilege invisible by, you know, saying that when we have access, we're not understanding that what we have is actually access in the first place. So I think access is invisible to those who possess it in that kind of way. Um, and I think this goes along with kind of the theoretical lens that I'm approaching this discussion from, which is um, something that Charles Mills calls the epistemology of ignorance. Um, and the epistemology of ignorance is, is kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy in this way. Um, because it constructs false knowledge such that it becomes this real sort of knowledge that we kind of embody socially, um, academically even. Um, and this real knowledge is obviously based on a fundamental falsehood, that blackness is oppositional to whiteness. Um, and that comes from obviously, I think Shadan's going to talk about the, the colonial idea and how that kind of informs this perspective, because obviously that's where it comes from. Um, this constructed narrative of the American dream that you know tells everybody that they can't have access to this. That is what whiteness is fundamentally based in, is that you know it is a meritocracy in that kind of sense. Um, so when I think about access, I'm thinking about how somebody is restricted access by this, this system of epistemology that creates this false knowledge that allows the system to continue, right? So then I think we once we have that definition of access, I think that we need to think about the broader area of what Kanye West is operating in, which is hip-hop, right? How does hip-hop, or how can hip-hop, transform access in the ways that uh, we'd like it to as critical race theorists and as cultural critics? And I think what, what hip-hop does, it, is a lot, it allows us access to these narratives that are previously rendered invisible. Hip-hop brings to the forefront these subjectivities that we've ignored, often purposefully, in order to continue living in this whitewashed world that renders everybody invisible, that isn't white. Um, I think that it encourages this examination of subjectivity and what, what Doc in his chapter in the book calls the Dionysian. Um, you know, this, this sort of, I'm not really sure what I'm trying to say here, um, but the, the Dionysian is basically, you know, this, this other world, we're, we're operating within this Apollonian culture that essentially tells us that you know we have to live high up in the tower. What hip hop does is breaks that down and says, look, you know, there's another side to this. There's a no, there's a whole other narrative that we need to access in order to inform this rationality, so called. So then we move, you know, we've got hip hop now position, right? Is Kanye transforming access? I think that's what we're all here to, to learn today. And you know, I'm actually. I think you're to learn that as well, because I, I think Con Kanye is kind of a contradictory figure for me, and I think for everybody on this panel. Um, and I think that's important um, that we recognize that. I think that that's also hopeful, because you know, so much of what pop culture is is this certain objectiveness, which I don't think actually exists. Um, but Kanye kind of opens the door to this, this discussion that allows us to see that there are two sides to this kind of, this kind of culture, right? So I think where I want to go with this is that the epistemology of ignorance has constructed a way of looking at Kanye that allows us to reduce him and all of his cultural claims to powerlessness. We render Kanye voiceless by making him a child or making him something that doesn't have a voice or is not making some kind of point. So whiteness actually attempts to shut down Kanye in this way. And I think that's really important because this has a pretty historical legacy when we look over you know, the culture of whiteness and how it constructs blackness um, as oppositional and as something that 
is in relation to whiteness. Um, so when we think of, I'm not sure if anybody has seen the, the South Park episode uh, about Kanye, but it's, it's, you know, we can laugh, right? But I think what that does and what that serves to do is to render Kanye as childlike. Kanye as this figure that we can reduce to be voiceless just like we have historically. Um, I think that, you know, the Jimmy Kimmel example, where Jimmy Kimmel's commentary that literally puts Kanye's voice in the voice of a child. We have that happening continuously. And I think that serves the purpose of whiteness in order to transform Kanye into something that is crazy. It doesn't make sense, right? But Kanye has a lot of important points. I mean, especially when we think about, you know, Yeezus as an album. Um, you know, I I'm not sure of any other rapper that's mentioned the CCA in his raps, right? So the CCA is the uh, Corrections Corporations of America. And it's one of the most powerful corporations today. And that's the private prison system. Um, and Kanye brings to the forefront in Jesus this discussion, um, unlike, I, I believe, any other rapper has, especially a mainstream rapper. You know, when you think about somebody like Common or KRS-One, who's talked about this for 20 years, um, but in terms of mainstream rap, I mean, we're not getting that from a Wale, we're not getting that from, you know, any, any like that. Drake. Um, yeah, Drake, exactly. I mean, <laughs> might get emotional on the track and talk about a breakup, but you know, we're not talking about CCA when we talk about these rhymes, right? Um, so I think that's really important that Kanye is bringing this to the forefront, literally, in this discussion, but white culture has allowed us to literally reduce his voice to that of a child's. What he's saying is crazy. This typical Kanye, like we're going along the same kind of paths, right? And I think that that's really important um, in terms of this, this conversation about access. I think that what Kanye does with his contradictory sort of access is, you know, uh, he, he navigates that in a very interesting way. And I think um, how he does that is, you know, he has this material access that we talk about in America all the time. So, you know, Kanye has access to types of money that, you know, maybe even white folks might not have. But at the same time, he's still up against this white narrative that constructs him as, you know, something that's crazy, something that isn't making sense, or something that, you know, is totally subversive in the wrong kinds of ways. But what this, you know, what we do when we childize his voice, right, is make this narrative, his whole narrative void, which I think is completely misfounded and misguided. Um, I think that the topics and messages that he wants to further, you know, have a historic, historical legacy of exclusion. And that exclusion essentially allows us to reject everything that, that comes out of Kanye West that's culturally critical. I think that, you know, when we look back at the rest of the album, you know, New Slaves is, that, that entire song is about this institutional racism that exists even in this higher level that Kanye occupies, right? So it's not just, you know, broke racism, it's rich racism. He, he makes the distinction between these two sort of pieces in New Slaves. And I think that's really important um, for, for this discussion. Um, I think that, you know, in terms of how whiteness constructs this access, if Kanye were to lay low, we're gonna give him access. We're gonna we're gonna uphold Kanye as you know the Grammy Grammy winning you know producer, uh, rapper, all that stuff. We can do that. But you know as soon as he comes up on stage and interrupts Taylor Swift, that's over. He's challenged whiteness in a way that a black man in America cannot challenge whiteness. That doesn't it does not work. It does not operate like that. And as soon as that move was made, we got We got to reduce him to something that he's not, which is crazy, which is radical in ways that are not subversive. And I think that. You know, that's, that's what we've done to, to Kanye. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not going to apologize for Kanye's behavior because it's the same track on New Slaves that, you know, he comes back to the revenge sex with a Hampton spouse, right? So we're not talking about a guy that is, you know, all about the subversiveness in the ways that maybe us as scholars might like him to be, um, certainly. But there is substance there that we are ignoring. And I think that is a function of whiteness that allows this epistemology of ignorance to continue to be recreated. Um, so that moves our discussion to you know, the ways in which whiteness perverts identity and image. And I think that that's you know, the discussion we're having right now, is that we're not allowed to use whiteness, or we're not allowed to use hip hop in this academic setting because it is seen as a lower form or a lesser form, which I think is totally 
you know, just going along with this 200 year, 266 year legacy of chattel slavery. Um, I think that this dualistic framework sort of denies Kanye's subjectivity. If he's either good or bad, we can't use pieces of Kanye to inform a discussion because he has been deemed as the bad, right? And I think that when we acknowledge this teachable Kanye, we can finally get a perspective that does give us a little bit of subjectivity in this, in this um, you know, framework. So it's not about access or no access. It's not about whether Kanye actually has access or doesn't have access. I think that Kanye deconstructs this notion of what access means in America. Because we think about wealth, right? We think about, well, no one man can have all this power. That's what Kanye is. He's got this, right? No, that's not the way it is. Because we have reduced his voice to literally that of a child. Thanks. Good job.